Michael Williamson. Right and today is Friday the 17th of June 1988. The name Graham Richmond is synonymous with the Richmond Football Club. Have a listen to this. He was coach of the fourths in 1959 and 1960. Coach of the under-19s 1961, 1962. He was secretary from 1962 to 1968. Treasurer in 1965 and then from 1968 to 1969. On the committee from 1972 to 1977. Vice President in 1971 and then from 1979 until he retired in 1983. Graham now is a Victorian selector. The only thing, Graham, you didn't do was play football for Richmond. Why not? Well, I, I was captain of the thirds uh, in 1952, I think it was, Michael. I played in the thirds in 51 and 52 and played in the reserves in the latter part of 52 and early 53 and I was selected to play in a Lightning Premiership. In fact, it's the last one the league conducted on the Queen's birthday in 1953. But unfortunately on the Saturday, I did my knee and of course history proves that it was a cruciate ligament. I had multiple cartilage operations because that's all people knew about in those days, but that sort of cut it off at the socks a bit. Did you decide then to become an administrator or did that just happen? Well, it's a terrible wrench like it is to any young man mm. who's uh, suddenly thrown out into the wilderness, as it were, where your whole ambitions are, are completely upset. And um, fortunately, Maury Fleming was a secretary and then later president of the club in that time, uh, with whom I had a great rapport, and he sort of took me on. He was my mentor and uh, encouraged me to stay with the club. Uh, indeed, I did recruiting work with Marty Bolger in the period prior to me commencing as coach of the fourth. So I never ever lost. And I think that's a great thing with keen young men that administrators can find a place for somebody who really wants to help. When you were appointed coach of the under-19s in 1961, it said in the club history at Richmond that it was the turning point of the club. Why was that? Well, I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you, Michael. I suppose it uh, just gave me a chance to have an influence on uh, various areas of the club, as most under-19 people have. You regard as the type of development officer, and uh, I became really conscious of the club's inadequacies at close range. We'd finished last at a senior level in 1960, and the club just was really in the doldrums, last having played in the finals in 1947. When you became secretary then in 1962, how old were you? I was 27. Well, uh, even your best friends will say when it comes to football, you can be pretty ruthless. And you had to be ruthless then, didn't you? Yes, we did, Michael. We needed, um, we really needed to take the stick to every aspect of the club's operation, on and off the field. and. Uh, Fortunately, I had the blessing of the late Ray Dunn, who was a strong man behind the committee at that stage. He'd become completely disappointed with the club's performances, and uh, a few of us got together. There was Al Board, Ron Carson, and the early days for Ian Wilson. We all decided that we were going to have a ding-dong go at trying to lift the Tigers, and that really was the start of it. What precisely was wrong with the club? Were they all sort of sitting back waiting for things to happen? Yes, well, Richmond had been highly successful through the 30s and the 40s. I think um, the recruiting had been allowed to run down. Um, probably people still expected the Jack Dyer image to attract people to come to Richmond. Our style of play really hadn't caught up with the development of the run-on game that had come via Melbourne and especially Geelong in the early 50s and 60s. We were badly undermanned. Occasionally we had sides that at full strength were pretty good. Mm. But we hadn't any depth. We just needed more players. Well, the previous premiership was in, what, 1943? That's right. Well, did you recruit specifically for the MCG around about that time, 1962? Well, at that stage, of course, we were still at Richmond. And frankly, I recruited everybody who could crawl, walk or run who could play football because we had that many holes that it was inevitable anyone who could play it get a game. But later on, of course, it became a much more specialised operation when indeed we moved to the Melbourne ground. We'll get on to that in a minute, but who was coach of Richmond when you started as secretary? Um, Des Rowe was in his last year as coach. Um, 
Des had been a great player for Richmond and I think did his very best with what was available. Um, but I think he'd be the first to admit that what he had available wasn't good enough. What we were doing probably wasn't good enough. And Des had uh, quite extensive business interests and I think he was probably happy to uh, give somebody else a shot at him. Around about that time, didn't you get the bright idea of uh, recruiting Ray Jordan to coach the under-19s? Yes, I did. Um, when I left the job, of course, as coach of the under-19s to become secretary, I sought out Ray, with whom I'd played in Richmond thirds and seconds. Um, he was at that stage coaching a junior side out at East Malvern. And, of course, he'd virtually given the football away after having been a top player in the VFA and concentrated on his cricket. And he was pl very pleased to take on the job. And, of course, that put all of our underage development mm. programs completely in place. Can I ask you something? And I want the absolute truth from you now. Certainly. Because I know you're Richmond through and through, but I really want you to be truthful. 1963 was the year that Ron Barassi was rubbed out, missed the final series, because he allegedly struck Roger Dean. Now, did he, in effect, hit Roger Dean? Oh, unfortunately, Michael, I didn't see it. Like yourself, I saw uh, television pieces yeah, of the business, yeah. but there's grave doubts when you know Roger. Roger's <laughs> a magnificent Richmond player. Indeed, he was captain of our 1969 premiership team. But Roger had a great sense of humour. He probably had a... Uh, an acting talent that was never ever developed professionally but on the field he was very very good at it so putting two and two together I'd certainly like to give Ron the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Ron will feel a lot better because <laughs> to this day he claims he never struck Ron. Well <laughs> when you know Ron I think you'll find that probably it's not in his nature much he's a fierce competitor but I think uh, football violence was never anything he was involved in. Well, Graham, it was the end of 63, around about the start of 64, that a big change came over the club because Ray Dunn, the late Ray Dunn, became president then, didn't yes, he? Yes, he did. And you appointed a new coach. Yes, I think probably the real turning point was a combination of those two factors, Michael. You've hit the nail on the head. Ray, of course, was a very prominent Melbourne solicitor of the time. He had uh, unbelievable connections through the commercial world. He was probably a in a position in his era that's held by, say, John Elliott of the current times. Mm. Um, I think probably the best recruit I ever signed was Len Smith, who, of course, had been at Fitzroy as a player and then as a coach. He brought to Richmond the modern play-on handballing style, play-on at all costs. Um, Len was a great football philosopher. He had really the first compact a manual on how to play football that I'd ever seen before football coaching had been a series of hand-me-down situations. Mm. Training and um, the organisation of football really hadn't changed that much over the history of the game. Players, as they came a bit more serious, probably worked harder, but we were still in the Tuesday-Thursday training situations. Mm. Nothing had changed, but Len was a person who was a time and motion expert by profession and he brought a lot of those qualities to his coaching. Graham, was he similar in any way to his more probably famous brother, Norm Smith, who coached Melbourne to so many premierships? They were similar in their outlook on the game but in their natures they were as different as chalk and cheese. Norm, of course, was a very fiery autocratic coach of the Checker Hughes mould. Um, Len was a very quiet um, fellow who abhorred the rougher side of football. I'm not saying that the genuine bumping within the rules, but he, he didn't want to know anything except what was in the rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say that they really weren't very much alike in personality. Well, it was quite dramatic. Uh, he took sick before he even coached Richmond in the match, didn't he? Oh, yes. Gosh, we had a rather upsetting year or two, but um, indeed in two successive seasons he had heart attacks and in after the second one he had to resign and subsequently became a selector of the club. But his influence was around Richmond until, sadly, he died during the season in 1967 and never saw his work come to fruition. 1965 
was that well, could have been described as a new era in the club, was a, a whole new concept was launched. That was the year you moved to the MCG, wasn't it? Oh, yes, it was, Michael. It was a bitterly fought issue of the time. In fact, uh, people looking back now would find it difficult to comprehend the circumstances under which Richmond moved to Melbourne. And really, only Ray Dunn and his um, professional knowledge and his own personal prestige could have pulled it off. It was an issue that wasn't generally accepted by a number of clubs who bitterly opposed it, feeling that us playing at Melbourne would have an effect on their own home crowds. Um, I think a lot of them really didn't want to see any other club have the facilities and the opportunity, uh, not only financially but recruiting-wise, to have this enormous asset at their disposal. But you also had dissension in the club in Richmond itself, didn't you? Oh, not to a great extent. I mean, there were the diehards from the cricket club who resented, of course, the cricket club. You must realise football had evolved as a means of keeping cricketers fit and cricketers, cricket clubs and councils held control over the grounds. It was resented by the cricket club until Melbourne pointed out that they'd considered them in their plan, made excellent facilities available to them, and that opposition was put to rest. A lot of the old timers resented the traditional or the loss of tradition of Richmond playing at Richmond. Mm. Or they thought it was Richmond, whereas in actual fact it was within the city of Melbourne, which was rather ludicrous. Right. But what about the other clubs? Uh, you know, I guess they had different uh, uh, reasons for objecting to Richmond's move to the MCG. Yes, Hawthorne were at the uh, forefront of opposition. They fought the issue very, very strongly. They felt that we'd transgress on their home crowds. I think both Collingwood and North Melbourne felt some sense of uh, trepidation about the move, although later on both of them came round in support mm -hmm. because they looked at it deeper and saw that the advantage to the game overall, that obviously there would be a difference in their split of the gate proceeds from playing Richmond at Melbourne as distinct from playing Richmond at Punt Road because the Melbourne ground had always had a proven support base itself, mm. that people came to watch football at Melbourne because they appreciated the protection from the inclement Melbourne winter. Just looking back over that period, what was the main reason, Ray Dunn and yourself, and you were the two driving forces behind the move, what was the main reason you wanted to move to the MCG? To win premierships? Yes, we'd looked at the possibility of improving the Richmond ground as a part of our overall plan for Richmond to come good. But whatever cost was involved was prohibitive. We had this long-term problem uh, going back to 1936, a proposal to widen the punt road uh, to improve the ingress and egress into the city of Melbourne. That was there, so it didn't encourage us much to spend money. And we just believed that the difference in preparation and playing on the Melbourne ground is against the punt road ground would put Richmond in a far better position as far as winning premierships was concerned. Just looking back, it really was a political hot potato, wasn't it, the move to the MCG? Yes, it was. I mean, I speak about it these days and people look at me aghast because they couldn't realise that people would be so small-minded. But, of course, uh, change always comes slowly. Mm. Things that upset the apple cart and the order of things are quite often not appreciated at the time, but... I think all the people who followed Richmond or come to matches involving Richmond since would have appreciated the vast difference between getting drowned on the punt road outer and being able to sit under the magnificent mm. cover of the uh, southern stand at Melbourne. On top of uh, those problems, uh, the move to the MCG and all the uh, political problems you went through, uh, you also had to switch coaches midstream, didn't you? Yes, we did. Actually, Dick Harris... Um, Dick Harris filled in for Jack uh, for Len Smith the first year that he became ill, which was in 65, no, 64. Then in 65, when he became ill again, Jack Titus took over at that stage. And we ran fifth that year, and we were looking very, very promising. But Jack was a magnificent man, but his, probably his coaching attributes didn't... Um, warrant us going further on a full-time basis. He was a pinch hitter, as it were. Mm. 
So we went and recruited Tom Hafey at the end of 65, coming into 66 from a very successful coaching stint at Shepparton. And of course, it was rather analogous to the move that was made in the 20s when Checky Hughes, after having been a pretty good player at Richmond, went away coaching in Tasmania. And Perce Page went and, and brought this forgotten, comparatively unknown man back to coach the great Richmond sides that came through the Golden 30s and then went on, of course, to Melbourne. So Tommy came down in that position. Before we get on to Tommy Hafey and your association, you also got yourself into trouble because trouble seems to follow you around. I think you create a fair bit of it yourself, and I mean that in the nicest possible way, if one can be nice about that. But you got into trouble with North Melbourne that year for poaching, if I may use the term, Dick Clay. Yes, well, Tom, of course, had coached Dick in the combined uh, Goulburn Valley League team but he'd also coached against him because Dick came from Kyabram and he fully appreciated his talents as a footballer. It uh, became known to us that in those days they were signed on Form 4s which had a two-year duration. It became known to us that Dick's form was uh, shortly cutting out, that he didn't have much ambition to go to North Melbourne and. Uh, Yes, it's true we signed him up and it's also true that it was a matter of, of league investigation and uh, considerable protests from the North Melbourne people, but it came to a, a satisfactory conclusion. Graham, I've got to watch my footwork with you. Did you poach Dick Clay? Um, oh, Michael, I think it's fair to say that we adhered to Dick's wishes to come to Richmond and we expedited the matter as well as we could. Beautifully put. All right, what about John Northy then? Well, John Northy had been signed by Footscray, who apparently made some decision not to pursue him. Um, as his form cut out, he agreed to come to Richmond also, and that was, I think, in 1963. And, of course, he went on to play in our 67 and 69 Premiership mm. teams. All right, well, um, you had a pretty dramatic ending to Tommy Hafey's first year, didn't you? Yes, you we missed did. The finals. We missed the yeah. finals, Michael. We had um, we had a good side, a good side. It was one of those years where, and of course, in those days, the finals were made up of four teams, where the four teams didn't slip. The lower rung sides weren't very strong. There were no upsets, um, and we just missed out by a vital game. In fact, mm. we probably cut our own throats at Essendon in the third last match of the year where we led into time on and somebody got a bit tired and left John Somerville on his own and he went bang bang and that was uh, goodbye Richmond. Well going into 1967 then, uh, you must have gone in with a fair bit of confidence. Yes we did Michael, our team, our forward line really revolved around two players in that 65-66 period. Pat Ganane and John Northey were the principal persons on our forward line and of course we realised that we needed to thicken up our talent a little bit more than that. We would tried unsuccessfully to lure Ted Whitten to Richmond after the 1966 Carnival. At the end of that season he had been replaced as coach of Footscray and uh, Len Smith had a very high opinion of Ted and we were anxious to get him to Richmond but of course he decided to stick tight to the red, white and blue. So. We also had a young man whom we'd brought across the previous season to play in our under-19s who went on to play in the under-19 and the reserve grade finals in 1966 in Royce Hart. Mm. And over the summer he'd worked very hard on his physique. No one ever knew for sure whether a young man could improve to that extent. Barry Richardson had come from St Pat's Ballarat mm. and run straight into a serious knee problem which also looked as though it had been put to rest. So we were looking much better in 67, and as the season started, of course, it did in fact mark the start of those two magnificent careers with um, Hart at full forward and Richardson at half forward. Didn't Sheedy start playing about this time? Sheedy started with us actually, um, he came across in 66 and um, decided then to return to Paran mm. for the rest of the year, came back to us in 67, but had the misfortune to hurt his knee. 
So uh, he needed an operation and, in fact, missed the complete final series. Looking through the history, I get the feeling that uh, the ruthless approach was still on because you sacked your captain, didn't you, in that year? Oh, yes, we did. Um, unfortunately, there was a, a, a bout of misadventure on an end-of-season trip which resulted in some disciplinary action involving a couple of senior players, and it's true that we did replace Neville Crow with Fred Swift at that time. Neville Crow, of course, now being president of the Richmond Football Club at this very day. Well, he'd understand now, of course, the necessity to administer discipline when ground rules are laid down. Well, looking back to that grand final, did you ever really think that you were going to lose it? Oh, yes, on many occasions, really? Michael. I think the lead changed 12 times mm. during the match. In fact, up until... You beat Geelong, didn't you? We beat yeah. Geelong. Yeah. Up until the, the classic match, I think, in 1985, it was either 84 or 85, involving Hawthorne and Essendon, many people considered that to be the finest grand final ever mm. played. Mm. It was a magnificent day. Geelong were very, very strong. Mm. They had uh, leading players such as uh, Farmer, Goggin, Marshall, Sherrick, Wade, etc., etc. Yeah. And um, they'd beaten us by five goals in a match during the season, and we didn't look real flash against them, I might mm. say. We'd had considerable trouble with Doug Wade in the previous seasons and also in 1967. We'd messed around with our full-back position, tried many people, thought that Fred Swift was too small to play on Wadey, but ultimately we came back to him right on the eve of the, the final series. And, of course, he put in a magnificent yeah. series. But the game itself was completely a game of nip and tuck. Mm -hmm. Bill Goggin kicked two goals just before half-time that put the Cats right back in business. And when we came out into the third quarter, John Sherrick, cut loose and we weren't looking very good at all at three-quarter time. Well, how, how were you faring at the stage as secretary of the club? Was it a very, very hard job in those days? Yes, it was, Michael. There's none of the bureaucracy involved now. In fact, it's probably quite interesting to recall that when I became secretary, I was also the person responsible for making up the pay, paying everybody. I was the recruiting officer. I answered the telephone, I was the receptionist, and I also did all the other jobs associated with secretary. In other words, I was the only person employed by the club. Yeah. But you, you did set up a very strong recruiting committee, didn't you? Yes, we did, Michael. We had the advantage of many of our former players being positioned around the countryside and interstate, and we were able to galvanise them into action They'd all been disenchanted with Richmond's results and probably it's fair to say that most of the clubs, probably Melbourne and Collingwood accepted, and I suppose Hawthorne, weren't really organised as we know them today. It was still a pretty much a hit and miss situation where the, where the administrations were really only out of the part-time era yeah. in football. Do you think it was a better era? Yes, it was. Money hadn't raised its head on a multiple basis as we know it. Um, there had been hints in the early 60s that there were contracts existing in players at the Geelong and St Kilda clubs, but we hadn't had any difficulty at all uh, during that time. We had players who came back from interstate carnivals or interstate matches insinuating that uh, clubs were receiving a were paying a bit more money to their leading players than we were, but somehow it never became a big deal. They just accepted the fact that we weren't going to do it, and that was it. Graham, it was about this time, the end of 67, you retired as secretary, and Alan Swab, who's now the chief uh, executive commissioner of the uh, Victorian Football League, he came from being assistant secretary at St Kilda to Secretary of Richmond. Yes, right? he did, Michael. I recruited Alan. My uh, purpose in coming uh, as Secretary of the club had never been to be a, a professional football administrator. I was only there to try and achieve a result in lifting Richmond out of the uh, trauma it was in. And once my job was done, I was in a position to go and get hold of Alan, who'd 
indicated to me that he would be interested if it ever came up, the job that is. He, I had worked with his brother for many years as a, as a young chap. Um, it was well known to me that the family, his father was a, rich, was a Richmond supporter mm -hmm. and I felt quite comfortable about Alan taking on the job. Right, well, 68, his first year, that wasn't all that flash, was it? No, it wasn't, M Michael. What happened? We, um, oh, look, it was a bit of a hangover. There's no good saying that we were, look, we weren't as desperate in 68 as we were in 67. I think the players thought that the good times would go on forever after celebrating the premiership. We ran into a series of injuries that affected almost all of our top nine players. In fact, there was a match we played at St Kilda where the only one of our top nine graded players, there was only one of them playing. Mm. And we lost games that we should have won, but we made a late run for the, for the four right at the end of the season, but it wasn't a good result, no. Now, you are on the committee at this time. Yes, I was. Right. You also got the reputation of being a motivator. You really can't stand people who don't give 100%. Oh, no, I think that there's a great deal of trust goes into these matters. Michael, if you look at it in its uh, philosophical content, selectors put trust in players to represent the club. The supporters of the club put trust in committees and persons working for the club to do the best they can for them. And it really narks me that people of that era didn't do what was required of them it knocks me even more today where people are being paid very big lump sums of money to uh, perform. I just believe that people expect you to perform at a certain level if you're being paid proportionately and it disappoints me when people for psychological reasons, in other words attitude reasons, don't yeah. perform. Okay, let's go to 69 now because uh, that was the time I think Richmond pulled the best attendances of any club in the league. In fact, they were the most popular club in the league at that time, weren't they? Yeah, so we had, uh, we certainly aroused the interest of the public, Michael. Um, the Tiger and the Yellow and Black and the long history of the club where Jack Dyer and co had really galvanised people in the 30s and 40s. Um, there were many, many people who'd gone missing at Richmond for 20 years who came out of the woodwork there was a new generation of people who grew up. We were a highly publicised club. Our propaganda machine had run rampant for five or six years and um, uh, there were most of our leading players were household names with the result that we did indeed draw very big crowds. But another traumatic or dramatic year, 1969, because from memory, I th weren't you going to sack Tommy Hafey at one stage or there was a big rumour went around that he was going to be sacked. Oh yes, of course these matters always come to the forefront when teams aren't performing as well as people would expect them to be, but I can assure you that there was never ever any genuine um, intention to do so. I mean it had been rumoured that a couple of our senior members of committee were not happy with him, but uh, a couple of us were then in a position to be able to put the acid right on the players to respond and show the best they could to answer the uh, the situation that was put up to them and uh, I'm very pleased to say that they were able to do that and we stormed home to make the finals we only made the first semi-final but we played Geelong and we set a league a then league record score in the first semi-final and went on to win the premiership. Getting back to Tom Hafey, didn't the players have a meeting? Yes, they did. I called a meeting at uh, that stage. I had the Vaucluse Hotel in Swan Street, Richmond, and we had a very memorable Thursday night session down there where it was put to several players that it was expected that they would lift their game a bit. Um, also, that they were in danger of costing a person who'd stuck so loyally to them and who'd proved that he could achieve the result as of two seasons before. And... Um, being the decent blokes they were, and we did have a very fine bunch of blokes at Richmond. In fact, it's not uh, insignificant that later on clubs saw fit to appoint so many Richmond players as coaches that it obviously had its response. I think a lot of young men went home with their heads buzzing after that particular session. 
Graham, was this a Graham Richmond ploy or plot to galvanise these players into action and maybe to put a little extra pressure on Tom Hafey? No, it wasn't, Michael. No, it was a situation that we seized on to, in other words, get the show back on the road. Mm -hmm. But the, it's true to say that there were probably one or two dissidents who weren't happy with the way things were going. In fact, it probably cost me the friendship of a couple of people at the end of that particular season mm. where um, you know, they were taken to task about their, what I felt was disloyalty during the season. Mm. I can remember at that time going to the Richmond Rooms, there was a big banner, and I think you were responsible for it, which read, winning isn't everything, it's the only bloody thing. Do you remember that? Yes, I must say that was Alan Swab's. Um, it really was Alan Swab's good work that that went up. It was a line that he'd pinched from Vince Lombardi, who was a famous American coach of the Green Bay Packers. And it was one that was just so apt with the way we played. I mean, we never made any pretensions about what we were there for. We were there to win at any cost. And uh, a lot of people might have objected to the way we did play, but we played it with full-blooded intent to win. I think just looking back at that 69 side, and I remember going to Adelaide, I was with Channel 7 at that time to see them play in the Australian <coughs> Championships, with the, which they romped in. That's probably as good a Richmond side as I've seen in this modern era. Yes, it's always difficult to compare teams. I mean, by rights, Michael, what you're saying should have been true because a great number of our players at that stage would have had three, four or five years of league mm. football and would have been you know, coming on to their top. Um, but we did have very good side in 1974 mm. also. Before getting to that, the reason I mentioned the 69 side and, and how good and how strong the side was, because in the next year they missed the finals again. What, what happened to them? Well, unfortunately, players like Roger Dean had reached the end of their tether. Paddy Ganane had gone by the wayside. Um, Michael Patterson had quite a nasty uh, knee injury which later on he took with him to Adelaide to coach North Adelaide but uh, our big man strength had been seriously depleted. Neville Crow had retired after being suspended during the finals of 1967 and we frankly at that stage were just too small. That's when you got the Whale Roberts about that time wasn't it? We did, we went to great pains to recruit uh, Brian Roberts from the East Fremantle Club. We'd pursued him actually since 1966 and we'd never been able to catch up with him. He signed with Carlton in between. They let his form lapse. He went to, he'd gone in between times to South Adelaide from the uh, Millicent, uh, Millicent team of South Australia. But we sat right on his tail and we finally landed the whale. Also, For better or worse. Yeah, we also brought across Craig McKellar, who was a very handy player for us from the Woodville Club in South Australia. Mm. It was about 71, the ruthless approach uh, reared its head again, but it didn't really pay off until, what, 72? No, we had the great success in 71, brought about by uh, the arrival at the club in a highly controversial swap for Bill Barrett in Ian Stewart. Mm. Um, Stewart had obviously um, run his race at St Kilda and Bill Barrett had gone into a decline brought about by excessive weight training and so yeah. forth with Richmond and we did what we thought was a mutually acceptable deal in that we swapped Barrett and Stewart. Well, Stewart came to Richmond and immediately got himself back on the track, got himself super fit, put in a magnificent season and finished up winning the Brownlow medal. We were eliminated in the preliminary final by a very good St Kilda team that year. We'd um, actually beaten St Kilda twice during the year, but <laughs> we went in with a side that was too big on the day and it rained like hell during the afternoon. And Al I remember Alan Davis played a magnificent game at full forward for them and uh, really gave us a stick and we were left lamenting after that match, I'm afraid. Well, you made the grand final in 72. Yes, we did, Michael. We went in as red-hot favourites. I don't... Well, there might have been hotter favourites than we were, but we were certainly considered to be a lay-down misere. And uh, I suppose that was probably our undoing. We may not have 
worked as hard on the preparation for the game as we possibly should have. We'd also had the misfortune for Michael Green to retire through entering into his legal practice at the start of the season, and he was our top ruckman of that time. And um, that left us just a little bit down the drain, I would say, at that time. And also, Ian Stewart had not reproduced his form of the previous season. Mm. In fact, he started that game as 19th man, with, again with Brian Roberts too. Uh, they'd both messed around a bit after, our, you know, the previous season. So, unfortunately, we broke the via the existing VFL record score for a grand final yeah, in that right. game. Yeah. But I'm afraid it wasn't good enough to beat Carlton. Carlton we certainly went better. one better, <laughs> yes. I oh, know, they were top Carlton yeah. side and good on them. It was that year you uh, appointed Royce Hart captain? Yes, we yeah. did. Yes, Royce had come out of national service and uh, Roger Dean, of course, had, had uh, retired and Royce replaced him. Graham, before going on, I've got to ask you this about Royce Hart. He often claimed that he got three shirts, uh, was promised three shirts to sign with Richmond, but only got one of them. Is that true? <laughs> no, I don't think so, Michael. We outfitted him with three shirts and a new set of, a new suit to take up his appointment on his transfer. I think it was in the Commonwealth Bank at that time. Yeah. Well, I always say he's the best footballer I've ever seen, particularly uh, under pressure in finals which uh, makes me wonder, what did you sign him for? Exactly what I'm right, saying. No big money. No, well, we assisted him with his board, I think, in the first year. Mm. All right, well, let's go to 1973, because uh, that was the year in the grand final that all of a sudden Big John Nichols went down. Yes, it was quite a spectacular collision. Uh, we had a very desperate young man called Laurie Fowler playing in the back pocket for us at that time, and... Uh, it was just one of those fluky sort of things where Nick came out to take what looked to be a fairly easy mark with his arms extended in front of his face. And, uh, of course, he'd given us merry hell the year before in 72, playing again in the forward pocket. And Laurie Fowler took off from the side and hit him at a 45-degree angle. And I think it would be fair to say that John outside his peripheral view, just never saw anything at all of what was coming. And Laurie was a very strongly made fellow of about 12 stone 12 and hit him going at literally, for Laurie anyway, about 100 miles an hour. And uh, even the mighty can fall. Mm. And John certainly fell and with that I think the hopes of the Carlton Club on that day. How did you feel when you saw Big Nick go down? Can you remember? Well, I like John very much and I've got the highest regard for him. But I must say I was very pleased to see him lying flat on his back at that particular stage. <laughs> With not much chance of jumping up in a hurry. No, I <laughs> oh, no, no. He was completely out of business on that occasion. Yeah, well, I can vividly remember this match because I was calling it for the Seven Network and there was another guy, Balm. He ran yeah. right that day, didn't he? Yes, oh, Neil Balm was a very aggressive player. Um, there were a couple of Carlton players who... Uh, suffered collisions with Neil on the day and came off second best. And, uh, but you must realise that we'd gone through a season of complete frustration in that having disgraced ourselves by losing the 72 grand final, which was there to be won, we virtually spent the whole year needling ourselves. It wasn't, no specific person had to really keep reminding anyone. It was hanging over us like the sword of Democles and it was a great matter of the very proud players of having to uh, write the record. Mm. Well you certainly did that and again the approach and Tommy Hafey's approach I'm certain it was yours too that uh, if you don't win the flag you've wasted the year. Oh yes I think so Michael. I think um, you know if you don't commence the season with the premiership in view we hear about team building and all this sort of stuff, but look, that's only a euphemism for accepting the fact that you're not good enough. Mm. I think everybody starts equal in the first game, and obviously you've got to have enough confidence in yourself to try and look at what you're competing for. And in those times, it's, uh, it's fair enough to say that 
we played in a manner that was just sort of kill or be killed. That's mm. how it was with us. Well, you won 73 and again in 74, but before getting to the 74 grand final, gee, that year was a pretty uh, hectic one for you because uh, Mel Brown was introduced and I think, frankly, he came a bit too late to league football, but that wasn't your fault. And you yourself got into a fair bit of strife during the year. Yes, oh, well, Malcolm was uh, to be our prize recruit in 74 to give us... We realised that after having won a premiership, where we'd previously made a bit of a mess of it, that we were going to have to probably introduce anything up to six players. And it was a fact that in our premiership teams, there were invariably something like six or seven team changes from one, even from one year to another. We were ambitious to emulate the club's previous double premierships of 1920-21. We had saw no reason why we couldn't do it. But as I say, we were conscious of the fact that we had to come up with new talent. We'd pursued Mel Brown since the 1966 carnival in Hobart, and uh, unsuccessfully, I might say, because he kept being appointed captain coach of some club or another as a ruse to retain him in the West, but he'd fallen out after having won a premiership with East Perth with the administration and made it quite clear that he desperately was anxious to come next year to just sort of put himself into the league scene. So he came across, he brought with him great charisma, Brownie. He's um, a fierce competitor. He was a bit of a football cheat. He probably couldn't resist the cream cakes where a lot of people get on the booze or chase the women or something. Brownies down for was cream cakes and ice creams. <laughs> if there was any way we could have hypnotised him to develop an allergy to sugar, we'd have been delighted to do so. But he was a marvellous fellow. We actually didn't go too well in the early games and really Brownie played outstanding football and kept our hopes alive. But he fell foul of the umpires once or twice and got a spell here and there and uh, Anyway, we got out to a, a pretty critical match. Essendon were under Des Tudden and were starting to fire up a bit and uh, we needed to improve our position on the Premiership ladder. I think we were fourth or third at the time. But we were looking, of course, always ever ahead to the double chance. So we went out to Essendon with the view that we were going to win at any cost. And um, any cost is putting it mildly. Um, Brownie of course was the centre point of the very vocal Essendon supporters objection to Richmond. He had that sort of attitude about him that the opposition supporters took great umbrage to and he certainly didn't let them down during the first and second quarters where he got into halts with Graham Jenkins and uh, with the result as we were coming off the ground in those days of course we team officials all sat on the boundaries. The coach, the match committee personnel that were required, we all sat on benches on the boundary. And as the half-time siren sounded, Brownie started to walk into the Richmond race and it was a peculiar setup in that the Essendon match committee sat in a position that was past the Richmond race. In other words, they had to walk past to get back to their own dressing room. And Brownie happened to walk in a position which was within hailing distance of the Essendon bench and uh, their runner of the time made disparaging remarks to Brownie who immediately clocked him. Well, all hell broke loose. There were bodies flew from all angles and uh, I must admit, I was uh, ruminating at that time on the fortunes or what had happened uh, in the game up to that point to make some hopefully constructive contribution at a half-time discussion. And I really missed the opening skirmish until I think it was Alan Swab or somebody poked me in the ribs and said, goodness me, have a look at this. And I spun around just in time to see a civilian lean across Mel Brown and give him a whack. And at that stage, Mel Brown was flat on his back with John Casson sitting on top of him. Well, there was... There were, n there were no policemen in evidence at that time and you can understand when you're involved with footballers as I'd been for so long you took great exception to unauthorised people I mean players fighting well that's par for the course 
but a bloke showing up out of the blue, uh, taking to one of your players was not on. So I took off in hot pursuit of this particular fellow. I wasn't to know he was actually an Essendon official, but um, anyway, there was all sorts of goings on, went on, and with the result that a number of us were reported and charged and went through a long, exhaustive investigation by the league, and uh, then unfortunately there was a follow-up with uh, proceedings by the police, and uh, we wound up in court, and fortunately that matter was dismissed, which then put the pressure on the league to review its own position in the matter, and where I'd been suspended for a... Oh, I was fined. I, I just really don't recall the exact details, but I was fined quite heavily and also suspended, I think, for two or three years. And uh, anyway, fortunately, wiser counsels prevailed at the end of the season and the matter was reviewed and uh, put to rest. Uh, and at the end of the season, you defeated uh, North Melbourne, who were then starting their climb towards their first premiership. Yes, they were, Michael. Ron Barassi had gone to North Melbourne as coach. A new administration had come to the forefront, led by Alan Aylett, uh, Albert Mantello and Ron Joseph and uh, they were really starting to wind up. They probably weren't ready for the position that they achieved that year in playing off for the grand final. Um, but anyway, good luck to them, they made it. But they were comparatively easy meet for us in the grand final of that year because they were just a bit too green. Well, the next couple of years weren't all that flash for, for Richmond because you, know, you lost a few players. Wild Roberts went to South, Teasdale and Jackson went to South. Uh, for a swap with John Petur, if I remember correctly. Mal Brown returned to Perth, and there was a bit of a decline. And then in 1976, Tom Hafey was sacked. Yes, he was. What, what happened, Graham? What was the true story? Because you really got the blame for that. Yes, I did, Michael. We went through 75 with a reasonable side. We were beaten in the preliminary final by North Melbourne at Waverley. Um, at the end of that season, we lost probably one of our most valuable players in Paul Sproul, who together with Kevin Bartlett were the really the crux of our running game. And we had very little luck in replacing Paul uh, through our own ranks, as it were. And indeed, we made a dive at John Petura, who'd made it known he wasn't happy at South Melbourne. And uh, we went off to great lengths to try and work him out of it and ultimately he did come to us. Um, it was felt at Richmond at the time that the club was in a decline. We were all aware of that. Um, there were, a, Although we still had players like Bartlett, Burke, Hart and Sheedy still with us, um, it was felt by a number of committee that um, probably Tom had lost his edge with the players a bit. We argued back and forth that if we were able to get fresh players, then that probably wouldn't be the case. They'd bring renewed enthusiasm. But the recruiting had wound down. Country zoning was in evidence at that time. Several of the clubs like Hawthorne and North Melbourne had prospered under country zoning. We had a particularly poor country zone together with Collingwood and Geelong. And um, we were finding it very difficult to come up with the numbers to bring in to stimulate the team. So a decision was made to dismiss Tom Hafey, which was a sad decision. It was not one that was made easily. I don't mind telling you. And it was Because not you were mates. We were very close friends. We'd been uh, junior footballers together. Um, you know, I sort of stuck my neck out a bit over his appointment. Uh, he was unknown quantity. We'd been very successful. Um, and unfortunately it did uh, fracture our friendship of that particular time. I'm glad to say that that matter has now been restored. But uh, yes, it was a traumatic time for all concerned. I ask you this, if you, if you had your time over again, would you do the same thing? Would you get rid of Tom Hafey? Because he was or has been the most successful coach in yes. the history of the club. I don't think so, Michael. No, I don't. I mean, it's all fa fair to say that North Melbourne had brought a new style of, or a new trend into league football of transferring play, of overlapping running, of um, high emphasis on skill on both sides of a person's body. 
they were really the most completely skilled team that we'd struck in league football at that time. Our emphasis was on a different style and we were going to have to, in other words, learn new tricks besides get new players. Right. But I think really we should have persuaded Tom to try and learn new tricks right. rather than got rid of him. Okay, well now, you go into 77, 78, 79, you had a couple of coaches there, Barry Richardson, then you had uh, Tony Jewell. But in 1980, Richmond were premiers again. That's the last one they won up until uh, this particular period. Yes, um, we'd gradually build up again, Michael. Losing Alan Swab as secretary was a major blow in between. Alan had been offered a job at the league. He was tired of the club scene. Fortunately, he wasn't going to be lost to football. But um, our recruiting ran down a bit following him going. And uh, it was only over the 78, 79 period that we were able to get it together again. Um, as I say, zoning really hit Richmond very hard at this time. And we were able to get the squad of players together that we needed and we came out and uh, we had a very good team in 1980. In fact, if you look back over our performances of that year, I, I'm not sure that any of our previous premiership teams could have surpassed them. Mm. Didn't you, uh, <laughs> you're a very truthful man, I hesitate to ask you this, but uh, didn't you needle behind the scenes Kevin Bartlett because he had an outstanding final series and he was just about finished really as a league footballer, wasn't he? Well, he was finished as a league rover, a matter that uh, Kevin debated hotly, I might add, and was terribly upset with Richmond at the end of 79 when he felt that there was the moves inside the club to, uh, to replace him, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. But what we were trying to do was to get him to recognise the fact that he was no longer able to play the game the way he used to play it. He had to improve his level of skill he had to be prepared to accept the new position in league football. And the half forward flank? Fortunately he did and I'd say that he probably in two final series that we were engaged in after that put in some of the finest displays I think the final series I've ever seen. Mm. In 1980 he had three he had uh, three matches in which he kicked seven goals mm. each. Mm. Now, mm. if a full forward kicked 21 goals in a, right. a final series, you'd be more than happy. Mm. But for a, a skinny old bloke to kick him off the half forward flank was little short of unbelievable. Were you aware at the time he had a hate on you? Because, <laughs> which, which he's now realised, you know, that yes. uh, you, that was your way of getting him motivated because you were very, very good at that sort of thing. Yes, he wasn't too happy with me. He didn't need to be a Rhodes Scholar to work that out. But uh, I think after the Premiership was won and he personally achieved such magnificent form, I think he might have realised that we weren't so silly after all. <laughs> Tell me, over the journey uh, at uh, Richmond, what's well, a quarter of a century you've been associated with them, it's a bit of a joke amongst other clubs, uh, although they're probably <laughs> very envious of Richmond. You you've get rid of captains, you get rid of um, coaches, you really, uh, you don't show, um, well, how can I put it? Well, you're pretty merciless in your approach to it. Would that be true? Well, unfortunately, Michael, the only way we were going to be able to squeeze the absolute last drop out of ourselves was not to accept anything but the highest possible standard. Because I can only reinforce what I've said earlier to you, that zoning had a very drastic effect on Richmond. We'd been very high-powered recruiters. We'd always been able to come up with 12 to 14 players to replace 12 or 14 off the previous year's list to, in other words, keep the youthful enthusiasm coming in. That had been eroded by the impact of zoning. And in other words, we had to virtually take ourselves to task to hang on as long as we could. And I suppose any test of anyone is that you can really only get the best out of what you've got. Our methods may not have been uh, widely accepted, but in actual fact, when people look back over what we had and what we did, I think they could honestly say that the Richmond administrations of those times did get the best out of what they got. Right. What's the best thing you ever did 
in your career in football? The best thing you've ever done? To sign Len Smith as coach at the start of season 1964. I believe he set the whole philosophy, the whole style of game, gave us fresh thoughts, gave us fresh ideas, just regenerated a run-down Richmond football club. What's the worst thing you ever did? Be involved in the removal of Tom Hafey. Mm. Well, of course, now you're a Victorian selector and somehow or other the Vicks haven't been going all that well with this state of origin set up. But you're not a man to sit back and cop that, are you? No, like uh, so many of we Victorians, Michael, I suppose it's a bit analogous to what the situation was at Richmond years ago, that um, we had become run down. Our ability to produce top-class footballers from with our own ranks had not been taking place. The game was dominated by interstate importations and we had to set about introducing uh, junior development schemes at the end of 1970 and the early 80s, which only now are starting to bear fruit. And I do believe that a resurgence of the VFL state teams is very close at hand. Graham, could I say this to you in conclusion? There may have been administrators as good as, but I don't think there's ever been one any better than you. It's a pleasure to have known you and thank you for an absolutely enlightening interview. Thank you very much, Michael. Graham Richmond, who has been associated with football for 25 years, but his big love is his own surname, really, Richmond.